Um, all right, welcome. Welcome to week two of our book group of studying through the mists. Um, how did everyone find the chapter this week? It's just really, some of the chapters really moved me and this one, I just found it just gorgeous. So um, I thought what we could do is go, actually go through the chapter just as a bit of a summary. But as we do that, if there's any parts that you found confusing or that you didn't understand, if you just raise them as we get to that part in the chapter, then we'll kind of clear up things as we go and it should deepen our understanding of everything. We've got um, people in the US and England and Sweden following along with us. And special, um, special word from Sweden, a big thank you from Anna for all your participation last week. She said it really added a lot of depth to the book for her. And so, yeah, it's lovely to have all those other people. And I, you'll have to excuse me referring to their answers occasionally because a lot of them raised some really beautiful points this week. So. Okay, so let's start on our chapter. We left Fred, he'd just been through the mists, hadn't he? He'd just gotten through the mists. And what was one of the major qualities that Fred displayed as soon as he passed? Uh, Rita? He, he was curious and inquisitive. Absolutely, yeah. He was really curious and inquisitive and he kept asking questions uh, immediately. He wanted to understand. And that was, that's probably the first thing that I wanted to raise with all of you. Um, last week, some of you really were inquisitive. Barbara especially was such a joy to have in the group because she was so engaged with her learning and her understanding and she was there at every moment. Oh, can I comment? Can I ask? Can I share? And that's how we are, if you think about it, when we're enthusiastic children. Uh, how we learn and explore new things. So I really want to... I know some of you were even worried for Barbara that she was being too enthusiastic um, last week. And I don't think there's any such thing... In, or that's not my vision for this group, that we should all just engage so much with this beautiful material. So um, please feel free to ask... As I want you to ask questions that I can't even answer. Um, <laughs> that's, how, that's how much I think there is in this book. There's so many um, meanings. And honestly, when I looked at this chapter, I thought we could go by paragraph by paragraph and we could be here till 10 o'clock tonight. And really, there's so much depth in a lot of what's said. So I just want to encourage you to, um, to chime in. Um, AJ said that if we were all as inquisitive as, as Fred, we'd all be at one with God really rapidly, you know. <laughs> if we didn't have any guile, if we weren't worried about how we were viewed and we just really engaged, which if you think about it, was how Barbara was last week. And a number of you also were very brave in sharing ways that you could see that these things were impacting on your life. And I wanted to acknowledge you guys as well because um, I can't remember, there was Joy and Deirdre, um, Barbara, I think, Moni, um, just people who were willing to say, yeah, look, I can see I've got this huge error that this is highlighting to me. That really takes humility, but it also adds a lot of depth for everyone else to, to what we're learning about, to really reflect on what these words we're discussing really mean. So I want to encourage that in you guys as well. Fred's leading by example. <laughs> Barbara? Can I just share the outcome for me for last week was, um, one, I had a realisation that I was angry with God for making me stupid. All right. Yeah. And that was a really big place for me to get to. And number two, this week reading was so easy and so um, joyous. It was just a total contrast to the week before for me. Yeah. And that was beautiful how you demonstrated to us just the humility in recognising Instead of trying to, a lot of us in life, including myself, we push through the areas where we feel stupid or we feel like less than, instead of just sitting with and feeling those feelings. And you did that. And I'm sure that's why it, it's getting easier. I don't believe that God made you stupid, Barbara. No. I don't feel you're stupid. <laughs> I do know certain emotions enter us as we're growing up that make it harder to receive different things, be they language or other knowledge. So, Joy? Um, what I learned from Barbara last week was that um, Barbara, because of her injury and not wanting to feel stupid, does every, anything that Barbara does, she does 
And um, and I've been the opposite to that most of my life. I was a, I was a smart ass at school. Yeah. And I think I only ever learnt to do the bare minimum to get through. And I realise with this that, um, and Barbara's example, that that's not going to get me where I want to go now. Yeah. Like, um, just doing the bare minimum is not going to be enough. Yeah. So if I really want to be curious and inquisitive, I've got to be a lot more thorough and a lot more detailed. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that's one of the major... Um, things that I wanted to encourage in everyone through these groups is this quality of self-reflection. And one of the big messages for me in this chapter was about God, how, how God sees what we do with what we have. It's not how much we have of something, it's what we do with what we have. And so I think that's, that's just such a beautiful um, lesson for me and I, I see it in what you're saying as well, yeah. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying there? Yeah, yeah. So rather than, oh, this is easy for me, I'll just rest on my laurels and cruise on through. If something is easy for us, wow, we can really engage with it if we have that desire and that humility. It's, it's whether it's, and that's the other thing that is really highlighted throughout the chapter, isn't it? It's um, how, what our motivations are when we do things. Because if, if things are easy... And we do, but we do them to get um, praise or approval. That's what God sees. If things are easy, but we do them for because we love them, or if things are hard, but we do them because we love them, God also sees that. So, it's like God has this amazing window into our soul to see really what what is the reason why you're in, engaged. What is the reason why you're trying? What is the reason? And and they're the they're the beautiful qualities that. Fred displays to us all the time, isn't it? Those, those like honourable qualities that we can all develop. Go, Joy. Um, the other thing I got on reflection last week, I said, well, I realised that I love um, discriminately, like mm -hmm. I'm not don't love everyone the same. And then you said, well, love precedes service. So I realised, well, that means I don't serve everybody the same. Yeah. And then I um, got to the place of looking at the way he Frederick is. It was in his life. And realise that um, would I serve if I wasn't seen? I'm yeah. going to reflect on that for a long yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great reflection, Joy. Yeah, yeah. Because as we see, true service is is not what you do when you're seen. It's not. It's it's that quality in our heart. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing. Does anyone else want to share a reflection on last week before we start? Rochelle at the back. Yeah, I um, did the homework last week because it was homework and I wasn't fully emotionally engaged. But this week, I nearly cried the whole way through Yeah. just because of I was praying to God, please let me be open emotionally to this chapter. Yeah. And it's the same when I'm watching movies. Like I have the, if I'm just watching it to pass the time or watching it just to – because I really want to feel this and yeah. it just that intention – yeah. made the huge difference. Awesome, yeah. awesome. So. so we're learning a lot about desire, aren't we? And how, how, like this is approaching reading a book. We can approach reading a book with a half-hearted desire or with a desire to avoid, or we can approach the reading with a desire to learn and grow. And really that's a metaphor for everything we do in life, isn't it? We can, we can engage in things because we want approval or because we want to avoid ourselves or we can engage in things because we really want to learn about God and learn about ourselves. So, awesome, awesome. All right, uh, Nora. Thank you. Um, about last week, and I still do have a bit of that, is fear, fear of being judged. And, um, yeah... Slowly, I'm opening up to that. So, so what are you opening up to, Nora? To, I'm opening up to just um, so I talk about my feelings, it, regardless of what people might think or say. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Feeling yeah. Judged. Can yeah. you see also that um, we can say we're afraid of being judged when we're really angry at people? and demanding that they, we don't want them to feel anything 
about what we do, which is often what you tell yourself. You say, I'm afraid of being judged, but actually there's a big feeling coming out of you saying, you have to put up with what I'm feeling. And we can, and be, some underneath that feeling is a fear of being judged very often. But we can make it, an, we can um, cap it with anger, which actually becomes unloving for everyone around us. And I know that that's, that's an issue for you at times. Okay, thanks for okay. that. Yeah. Alex, and then we'll get started. So I just wanted to just repeat what Rochelle was saying. Was just, I was just amazed and staggered at, at how open I was emotionally to this um, chapter this week. And just the contrast that it's been for me in reading this book before, I was just never really open to it. And um, just really felt my guides and God with me the whole way. That's great. And yeah. just, yeah, it just about cried right through the whole thing and triggered so many different emotions. It was just really amazing. Awesome. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's get back to Fred and talk about what happened. So he's there in a land of surprises. Everything he thought about um, passing is different, isn't it, from what he thought? And right at the beginning of the chapter, he again thinks about the earth, doesn't he, and correcting the error that's on earth. And he says something really beautiful. He says, he, he cries out to God again, doesn't he? And he says, um, I know not yet if I am saved or lost, but in thy mercy hear me, and in thy pity for the sons of men permit me, if it be possible by some means which I do not know, by some method thy love is able to devise, once more to make my voice to reach the mortal state, to help to lift the weight of error lying upon the shoulders of my fellow men. So he, he immediately arrives, doesn't he, and he wants to go back and just help everyone to, to not be afraid, to not worry about this thing that everyone's so afraid and worried about. Um, does anyone have any questions about that passage? Because there's a few questions from other people in other areas. So, uh, Jane, if we go to Jane first. Yep. yep. Um, Mary, I had a quick question what the Songs of Zion was. Sure. And I, I did look it up both on the net and then got the Bible out as well. Yep. But I'm just, yeah, I'm just a bit confused. Sure, let's, that was yep. someone else's question as well. Just when you're using the mics, guys, if you can, um, rather than point it parallel to your body, oh, just like put it, yeah, yeah, more out that way. Yeah, that'll help. Okay, so um, that's just below the part that I read on the first page of the chapter. And he says, um, Many have not tasted thy great love, many have not felt thy grace. Many are groping in the dark, blinded by traditions of men. Many have wandered from the fold. So he's speaking to God and saying that, you know, many people have, have lost sight of you and have lost sight of your love. The songs of Zion have been forgotten in the greed for fame and wealth and power. So Zion in the Jewish faith is the promised land. It's the place, and I'm... This is my understanding. I'm going to refer to AJ in a minute to make sure that, I, that I've got this right. So the Songs of Zion in, is a metaphor, really, for the purity of the people's faith. Can you see that? So the Songs of Zion are the songs that people used to sing, f longing for the, for the promised land, the land where God rules. And so he's saying the Songs of Zion have been forgotten. People's beautiful, pure faith has been, has been forgotten by them and it's been replaced by greed for fame and wealth and power. So does that make that clear? Yep. Uh, Barbara? Um, my understanding of the Songs of Zion was really also the total book of Palms. The book of Psalms, yep. the, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So AJ, could I ask you a question, babe? It, in this, it refers to the songs of Zion, and I took that to be a metaphor for the people's faith. But Barb's saying that's actually another name for the Book of Psalms. Is that right? The, the song of Zion. Songs of Zion. <coughs> um, I was just reading it. He says the songs of Zion have been forgotten in the grain, in the greed for fame and wealth. And so I took that as a metaphor that he's talking about the purity of people's faith has been lost in favour of greed and 
the longing for fame. Yeah, but the songs of thine, as Barb pointed out, was referen- was referencing the Psalms. But in the Psalms, there's all this pure emotion coming out towards God. Yeah. Like so, if you read through the Book of Psalms, in in many places, there's all this very strong, pure emotion coming out towards God. Yep. And um, it's actually written in in the way of a song, isn't it? The Psalms. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Or in in poems. 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 Yeah. But they're yep. often put to music. Yeah. Um, but the the issue that he was trying to raise here was that we've lost the heartfelt religion. Yep. For the sake of the of the manufactured religion, yeah, and um, and that's really the primary problem that we have on earth with regard to all forms of worship of God, is yep. that instead of becoming something that comes from your heart to God's heart, and from God's heart to your heart, now it's become a whole book of rules and a legislation and law and all Absolutely. these other things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, darling. <laughs> Joy. I'm not sure whether this is right, but I, I felt that that was talking particularly about the people who were professing to lead. Um, thou knowest, O oh my God, the blindness of ignorance and ignorance of those who now profess to lead thy children on. Many have not tasted thy great love, etc., etc., etc. Yep. I thought it was particularly talking about the, the leaders. I think that he's, he's referring to the leaders because they're the ones who are leading all the other people. So, yes, he's talking about the, the people who are teaching faith have lost true faith as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, Barbara. Yeah. Um, also, the Songs of Zion, um, if you, if the, as, as the Book of Psalms, um, that's where um, the Lord is my shepherd came from and all of those really um, um, worshipping God um, poems came from and a lot of them were put to music in later years. Yeah. So, so as AJ said, that heartfelt yeah, yeah, feeling for yeah, God is yeah. very inherent in there. Yeah. In, in actual fact, um, something that I read said it was invaluable resources for the worship of God, um, forgotten by man. Yeah, yeah. right. And beautiful. I thought that was very beautiful. Yes, yeah, yeah. If we just go behind there, Anto. Mary, it reminds me of, um, you know, the slaves? The, sorry, the, the slaves? The American slaves? Yes. They used to sing with such passion, and that's still there in their churches? Yes. It's very moving, the way they sing? Yes, definitely. The gospel singing, yeah. yeah. Okay, so it seems there's a theme, isn't there? This, this feeling that a true faith comes from our heart, and that's what um, this lady. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Was just talking about this heartfelt feeling in the gospel tradition. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and from uh, at the end of that passage. Uh, Fred says, if any joy is here for me, O God, my Father, I am ready now to forfeit it. Now, that is such a beautiful um, sentiment, isn't it? So he's saying, if the penalty I must pay is agony in hell, I am willing to endure it. If in thy mercy thou wilt send me back with power to tell the truth of thy unchanging love and lift the load of doubt from those who seeking know thee not. So that's a, I just found that such a moving um, sentiment that he would be willing to give up everything he has in order to just shed some light for other people. Uh, I had a question from someone in another area. I'm just going to find it. Julian Brisbane asked... She said... Is Fred referring to hell as the earth? So is he saying, I'll be willing to endure hell, like go back to earth, in order that they might um, learn these things, or in the biblical belief of hell? Um, So in answer to that question, I feel he's saying, remember at this stage, Fred doesn't even know anything about heaven or hell or how the whole operation works. All he knows, he realises he's going to have to change something, change his beliefs because everything's not as he expected but at this time he still believes there's a heaven and a hell and he's willing to actually not just go back to earth but if when he goes back to earth he then has to go to hell he's willing to do that that's 
there's got to be a pretty pure heart involved in such a sentiment, doesn't there? Uh, if we go to Alex and then die, and then we'll come back over. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was feeling his emotions or my emotions here, because um, I felt there was some error about um, this, and what Daniela spoke about last week about you know we have to go out and, and give people the truth. Um, and I guess I don't know if it was coming from a pure desire in him. It, it sounds like it, it was now, you know. Um, so where do you think his error might be, Alex? Um, in this, I just felt frustration in him in the, like, people need to know this, that, you know, that, and this kind of, um, this desire to change things. Maybe I felt an error yeah. in that, which I know I have. Can you see that if, again, it's about the, the motivation and that's something that comes up so many times through the chapter. Mm. When, we're, when we're inspired by love, we will do great things to assist other people, including give up a place in heaven in order to come back to earth. Um, if, we have a, if we have a feeling of um, anger or demand that it happened, then immediately there's some reason, there's something in it for us. Yeah. So very often, I know in the past, I wanted the whole world to change and I was pretty angry about it. And that was because looking out at the world triggered all this sadness in me that I wasn't willing to feel. And also I wanted... You notice very often when we have that kind of emotion, we're pretty impatient with everyone else around us that they should start doing the changing and they should start help us doing the changing as well. So right away we can see that's an impure thing and there's something in it for me and that is I don't want to feel sad or I don't want to feel unloved, mm. for example. Now for Fred, for a start, there's absolutely nothing in it for him, is there? Yeah. He's just had a pretty miserable life on earth and he's gone to somewhere that seems actually really beautiful but he, he just has this heartfelt feeling inside of his heart which is for his fellow man that they shouldn't suffer. Um, any longer than they have to. I guess, my, like my feeling is, is a lot of many people don't want to know the truth. So, like, what's the? Yeah, I, I just felt there's an error in like trying to. Well, I have to go back and tell them the truth. When I just feel like most people, and this is the way I feel at the moment. I feel like most people don't want to know the truth. Yeah, well, I can see about sixty people here who want to know the truth. At least yeah. in some way. <laughs> okay. It's just, I, I have this huge frustration about, um, I've spoken truth to a lot of people, family and friends, and they dismiss it because simply for whatever reason, you know, mostly it's because of you know, AJ's identity, saying he's Jesus or what, whatever, you know. And yeah. I just, I used to have a lot of frustration about that. Now I just feel like I've just given up sort of thing. Yeah. Can you see though that... Um, by having a frustration about it, yeah. it's showing you that there's something in your soul that isn't love in, yeah. in the way that you're telling people. Yeah, I, I um, can feel that. Not in the way that you're telling people, your motivation for telling people. Yeah. Like if I really love you, if I really love you from a pure place, I'll say, Alex, I know the secrets of the universe and do you want to know about it? Because yeah. it is going to save you a lot of problems. Mm. <laughs> um, and if you say no, okay, okay, Deb, do you want to know the secrets of the universe? Because <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And if she doesn't, I'll go, oh, he knows them. Uh, Lily. <laughs> <laughs> do you see what I'm saying, though? Yeah, I, I do, and I don't do that anymore. I just have this, I don't know, it's just a sadness about it now. I just feel like there's just going to be 60 of us doing this for the next 30 years. And Yeah, and I suppose you're... you're this reading has brought up feelings of frustration yeah. and sadness yeah. for you, and but the, great, I, I, feel I felt them. about it, and, and it was actually about a fear that that I'm going to be castigated by society. I'm going to be the only one doing this in the end, and I'm just going to just cop all the judgments and hurt and attack from society, um, and that's kind of where it's going now. I feel. Yeah. So there's yeah. there's emotions there. Yeah, for you I to definitely. Feel about it. Yeah, yeah. Huge. Yeah. 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 But I think. I think what I want to point out is that when we really love, there is a lot of desire. Remember last week I said how love will precede service. It will. 
If you're in a state of love, you will want to serve. And that's what Fred's displaying there, isn't it? He's mm. saying, how can I possibly ease the suffering of the people on, on earth? And if only they knew. You know, I suffered when I was on earth. And he says later how people used to tell him, that's it, you're going to hell. Mm. And here I am, I've arrived and people are telling me, don't be afraid. There's some love here for you. Mm. And, and so he's... When we have love, we're going to have desire. We're going to take action. So this idea that um, uh, uh, if I know the secrets of the universe, I'll just sit here and have my relationship with God and be... I could almost... There's no way we're going to become at one with God and not desire to tell Joy and Deb and anyone else who will listen, not in a forcing or angry way or a way that would leave us frustrated if they didn't listen. Mm -hmm. If that happened, it's just a matter of then looking inside of us and saying, well, what's the impurity in this desire? Because if I purely loved this person, I'd want to give them the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't want it, then I'll give the opportunity to somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to die. Sorry. No, we should wait for the... Do you mind if we just come to Deb first and we'll come back to you, die? Sorry. Yeah. Well, I was just feeling what you were saying and I felt like there's attachment and whenever there's attachment, we're in the wrong place. Yeah. Well, there's something in it. I always feel like oh, there's something in it for me. I want something for me out of this exchange. When I don't, it's, it's much... And, and I want to give a gift, then I won't have this kind of emotional reaction against the person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Di? Um, guess what it really struck for me was... Um, Afra's just total appreciation of how loving God is and, um, and how he just wanted to share that truth yeah. with everybody in the world because of how we misinterpret everything. Yeah. And um, it just made me reflect on that desire in me that wants to share about God's love and truth with the world and how I'm still so afraid yeah. of so many things and... Um, and how I've still got a long way to go to reach that level of um, purity of desire yeah. that he demonstrated. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that is so powerful. Through, you know, if we skip to the end of the chapter where Omra greets a man who has fed the, fed the starving and clothed the poor and um, ministered to the sick... Um, and he says, well, no, I haven't done anything like that. And he says, well, yes, you have, and these are the ways. To me, that just brought up so much about what am I, do as I said to Joy earlier, what am I doing with what I have because um, I can serve. <laughs> and very often, like I see in lots of you, a big desire to, to share about God, but there's a lot of excuses that we make, isn't there? Oh, I'm afraid, I'm not ready, I'm not perfect. And, and a lot of those things are not love, they're fear, <laughs> and they're, want, they're staying invested in our self-image, aren't they? So, yeah. Uh, Anto? Yeah, I just want to say it's quite amazing. Like, he just hit the spirit world, and instead of being selfish, like, to the extent that I've done in my life, like, he's not wanting to observe everything else and um, find a place for himself or do other things. He's just interested in just undoing truth. Undoing and error, yeah. Yeah, it's, yep. there's no other thought process. Yeah. It's just Abs truly amazing. It's a real gift. Absolutely. And I was going to ask you all to reflect on the different qualities that Fred shows us all through this chapter. So he's arrived. He's not... Someone said to him simply, do not fear. And he trusts that. How many of us just trust that until we get the next piece of information? Uh, it's very few and it actually limits our growth and our learning immensely. If we could all just trust that we will be shown and that more truth will be given or if we're in error, we'll be corrected, but we'll just trust what we can see to be the truth for now, um, things go a lot smoother. And for Afra, they really do, don't they? What other qualities does he show us just really early in the chapter? Yeah. One thing about this wanting to share truth with those on earth, when those around him who have been there longer say not yet, he's, he's quite happy with that. Like there's no, I've got to do it, sorry. Yep. And I know for myself, when I'm sharing truth with some of my family, I really want them to understand me. Yeah. And so I get angry about it and there's this, I must tell you. So, but he doesn't get caught up in that. 
No. So what, what are the qualities he's showing us in that? Um, humility. Absolutely. Um, no expectation. Yep. Yep. Um, I don't need everybody to do it my way. Yep. Um, yep. So there's a lot of humility in that and a lot of feeling. There's no entitlement in him, is there? There's no sense of I'm better and I'll do it best. He's saying, this is my desire. Can I please help people? And they're saying, you're not ready yet. And he's like, okay, but I'm still going to have my desire. Now, there's another big lesson for all of us, isn't there? When we go, oh, okay, I'm going to go and like, I don't know, snowboard down Everest. And someone goes, you're not ready yet. Oh, okay, that's it. I'm not doing it. You know? <laughs> That's, that's really common, isn't it? We're very used to immediate gratification in our world today. And so he's teaching us that as well, isn't he? He's showing humility. He's saying, okay, and he keeps asking questions. This inquisitiveness is really with him. Yeah. Or we go ahead and do it and do more harm than good. Yes, and that's where we have arrogance, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he's very sensitive to what's happening around him. Uh, if we go to Nat first and then... It's, I know, I love that you're all really involved, but we can't get to everyone. So, yeah. um, I noticed in the first chapter, he trusts love. He trusts that God's a God of love. And yes. even though he's being told different, he trusts the feeling in his heart because yeah. of the way he sees people respond to love as opposed to anything else that's being taught. Yeah. So really, in his life, Fred, he really lived outside the... the um, popular custom of the day, didn't he? He lived outside of the regular church growing group, but he trusted love. And if you think about it, he saw the power of love and through some of the stories that he tells about his earth life, he saw the power of love when he interacted with the people in poverty and he loved them. He saw what was there. And some of the responses I got from people in other areas were... um, about the grief they have about their own church upbringing, which taught them to fear God and not trust in his love. And I can see that's a big injury for a lot of people to grieve so that we can trust that God is loving. Yeah. Uh, if we go to Mori at the back and then to Lorleen here. Yeah. Fred's very excited. Uh, he is, yeah. And he has some knowledge of what happens when we pass. Um, well, he doesn't, does he, when he, when he arrives? He's no, just he, learning that's it. That's right. Yeah. He's yeah. just learning now. Yeah. But if he was in this room at this stage of his development, he would be giving off this excitement. Yep. He'd almost be glowing. And if people who knew nothing of any of this were near him, would they perhaps be attracted to this energy? Like he'd well, be almost... Mori, sadly, in the world that we live in, (laughs) if I think about Fred when he first enters the spirit world, and that's where we're up to, isn't it? He's just entered and he's going, what's going on? Now, he has quite a degree of natural love in him um, because of his attunement with love on earth and he's developed that and he's been quite a moral character. So he has that stage of development. But also, he's full of questions, similar to how... Very similar to how Barbara was last week. She was humble. She's going, I feel stupid, but please, could we talk about this? And what does that mean? And can I share? And that's how Afra is. Now, last week, if we just take the example of Barbara, very many people felt worried. What's, you know, you're making a fool of yourself or just be a bit quieter. You don't hog all the space. Don't. So there's actually a lot of pressure in our world and a lot of people are repelled from people who act in a very childlike, open manner. So, yes, many of us may be attracted to Fred. Um, Some of us not because of different feelings we have about our fear of being humiliated. We might feel that Fred's acting... He he should just shush up and let everyone direct things, you know. Don't keep drawing attention to yourself, Fred. Like, some of us might be like that. Some of us might think that, this guy's asking too many questions. I want a bit of attention myself. So some of us might be repelled by that. Others of us might feel more of his soul and say, wow, I could learn something from this guy. He's he's a really open character who's willing to admit that he might be wrong and and trusting in love and wanting to learn more things. If we could feel that about him, we'd probably be quite attracted to him. But sadly, the world doesn't really reward things like that at the moment. I'd like to be more like him. Yeah, Yeah. me too. (laughs) Thanks, Mary. Uh, Joy, and then Lorleen. 
You <laughs> set a hand off of it. Um, oh, gone blank. Um, he's really open to learning, like not just not just the curiosity and inquisitiveness, which means that he learns this many revelations. Whereas some people would go through that same process and learn none. Yeah. Um, so all those revelations are available to us, but only if we have that. Um, well, he's self-reflective and, and he's reflecting on what he sees, isn't he? And yeah. this is something that I'm really trying to yeah. encourage you all to... Like, let's look at everything around mm. us and think, what's this teaching me about mm. myself? What's it teaching me about the way God operates the universe? Yeah. And so he's open to learning new things, whereas one of the things I learned about myself just recently is how much I hang on to my own views, yeah. how, how much I'm invested in what I know. Yeah. That, um, and he doesn't have that at all. No, yeah. he's, so he's he's, willing to he give says up. somewhere just over the page, I think, well, everything I think is probably wrong. <laughs> so mm. I can't, re I'm, I'm wondering, is there a judgment hall? But oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks. Lorraine? Yeah. Um, what came up was that um, my own reflection about love and how it ties in with humility, um, that um, uh, Fred, <laughs> I call him Fred, yeah. uh, the way he approaches everything, whether it's learning or anything, it's very expansive, it's very inclusive, and um, um, I've re reflected on my own sense of when I feel contracted and in competition and all the negative things that might go on that even though I'm trying to aspire to love, um, it just brought it very clearly um, mm -hmm. how a child, um, that's what love is. They're, they are love, aren't they? They just, as you explained it all, it's just, oh, yeah, this and that and this. And if it's wrong, okay. And, but when I'm in my, oh, questioning thing and I'm not sure and all, it's all about fear, even though I think I'm going the same way. It's entirely different. And, yeah. yeah it's, so we can try to act loving or yeah. be loving but when we're in a state of fear and trying to prevent things around us yeah we can't really love yeah and, and so it takes humility i agree yeah and yeah. it's humility that brings us down to um the openness again you yeah. know the vulnerability and, yeah. and then we can expand through it yeah. and i think that that uh, uh the word um self-absorbed comes to mind from myself yeah. Yeah. and uh and I get the opposite from what he's saying it's Absolutely. just totally out there yeah. and and exposing himself yeah. even to anything yeah yeah something I've really learned about myself is that when I'm in a state of fear I am completely self-absorbed it's very hard like I, I'm just thinking about what's going to happen to me now <laughs> you know that's when I'm living in my fear if I'm experiencing my fear then immediately I can be more connected to everyone else again. But if I'm just trying to prevent my fear, if I'm living as if fear is the truth, I become very self-absorbed and self-centred. And Fred's showing us a totally other way of being, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. It's not that he's without fear. Um, do you mind if we just... Does anyone have more questions about that section? We'll, we'll just keep going through the chapter because I'm sure all your reflections are going to... Um, yeah. Okay. So he keeps, he keeps going on. And does anyone have any questions about the next section where he says, I who uh, more than once, twice or thrice had been cautioned that the life I led could only meet with con condemnation at the bar of God. What does he mean by condemnation at the bar of God? What does that phrase mean? Uh, Luli? She's just here in this. Yeah. Uh, punishment for his sins? Yes. And so, yes, he's saying condemnation at the bar of God. So jo God's judgment of me, I suppose, is how I understand that phrase to be. Um, and yet I found the first words addressed to me were words of hope and encouragement. I need not fear. How different a declaration is made on earth where the love of God is limited to suit the requirements of every sect while wrath and retribution are left as infinite qualities to drive the sinner to salvation. That's a pretty powerful uh, statement. Uh, and it made me reflect on the fact that 
fear governs our earth, doesn't it? It's fear that governs everything that goes on. But what we're seeing is that God's love actually rules the universe. It's just that man's fear at the moment is governing this little sphere called earth. Yeah, Barbara? We've said Fred's a bit childlike in his things, but I see it as total innocence. So with that innocence, he's totally open to God's love. And with that innocence, no fear is, is popped into anything that he's absorbing. You know, So for his desire to go back to earth and help people, he didn't even give it a contemplation that... And no fear came into that whatsoever. And that's I see the, the, the he's just so into... God is love and all of the love that none of the other negative things have even come into his um, contemplation at this stage. Do you think it's that or do you think he's just humble to them? Because he, he is contemplating, I might have to go to hell <laughs> yeah, but that's, But this. it wasn't a fear though, was it? Well, I feel that he was humble to the fear. So oh. he said, okay, mm. that might be... Mm. I might be really frightened about this, mm. but I, I, my desire is more than that feeling and so in that moment love could guide his desire rather than fear because also he talks about the judgment hall doesn't he 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 begins to ask like Helen when's the judgment coming yeah like, it's inc- <laughs> he's he's not he's not saying when's the judgment coming I'm terrified but he's saying hang on I think there's going to be some judgment here you should can you tell me about that? Yes, so. all of these nice things might not be for me at the end of the day because there's some judgment waiting around the corner for me or yeah. just over the hill. Yeah, <laughs> but he's humble, isn't he? Yeah, he's not he saying, oh, I want to prevent that or I'm better than that. He's saying, well, I'm a man who's lived on earth and there's going to be judgment coming probably. Could you just tell me about that? Mm. So I agree mm. he's very innocent, innocent. and open. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't, yeah. I don't believe that he's completely without fear. Babe, would you? What do you think, AJ? <laughs> uh, I think there's a fear in you asking me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would say so. I don't want to teach an untruth, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So let's say maybe he is without fear, or maybe he. Um, I I feel that he has. He's just a very humble character. Yeah. Remember that he's entering. Well, perhaps you don't know. He's entering the spirit world at about the top of the first sphere or the the bottom of the second sphere. So he certainly hasn't dealt with all of his his emotions, his fears, and his um, problems that he's that he's had. His grief with his mum, as we see later on. And so, yeah, yeah, I think he's just a very humble character. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else in here? Uh, Diana. I felt like Fred had actually like lived on earth challenging a lot of fears. Yes. And he was like used to, so used to being judged and condemned and by the class that he was born into. Yeah. Um, that was just that's just what happened to Fred. It was all, like he just felt that that's just what happened to him because he was willing to um, do from his heart. Yeah. And isn't that an amazing lesson for all of us to to make the um, to make the link between how we live here on Earth and how how living in the spirit world will be? If if we are in a state of always living in our fear and never challenging it, we know it's not going to be any different when we go. We're still going to have to work through that when we enter the spirit world. Whereas if we live our life uh, here in a way that is always challenging our fear, is always like aiming towards trusting God's love and having faith, then as we enter the spirit world, things are going to go pretty smoothly, aren't they? Yeah, so can I just yeah, yeah, sure. say something else? Yeah, and I feel like because of that action and that challenging of his fear, he arrived and was so surprised at how, how much love there yeah. he just felt in that space. Yeah. And it was like that was it for him. It was like... <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And that's something that I find really moving about this chapter is that he, um, I guess I feel how strongly fear governs this earth. 
and love governs the celestial realms. Now, I know that love actually does rule here. <laughs> it's just that man is using his will so in opposition to it. mankind as a, as a collective generalisation there. It's so much against the love and in the fear that it, it seems that fear governs just about every interaction that I have here on earth. And I suppose what I'm trying to say is that if we can be loyal to these beautiful qualities that we know of love and truth and humility here, it will be challenging <laughs> for sure. But what this chapter is showing us is that there's a place where that is like going to fit right in <laughs> and there is rewards. And I believe there's rewards in our soul even now when we're loyal to those principles in our own lives. We feel them in our soul, the reward of being loyal to love and truth, even if it's not a reward coming from outside of us. But the chapter shows us so clearly that when we pass, God sees all of those things as well, and there are rewards, uh, which is it's very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, if we go to Rose and then Lolly. Um, his reading this, his humility just touched me so greatly. His um, he just keeps on going, loving, and I know that I have such a lot of fear of being. Um, humiliated and shamed and I've been observing myself this last week of how I would tend to crumble and cave in inside um, and, and this chapter enabled me I've had to wonderful thank you God laws of attraction this week where um, I was able to observe where the point where I would have crumbled and I didn't and I just kept thinking of love and no being my truth which was such a wonderful opportunity for me to move through this fear that I've carried um, mm. and, and le having learnt to look after other people's emotions. So when you say, um, just to be more clear about what you're saying, when you say you crumbled, that means you modified yourself in order yes. to uh, make everyone happy around yes. you? Yes, But in this last week you had some opportunities where you went, no, this is who I am and I'm just going to keep being this person. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. And, and I've read this chapter two or three times because there's just so much in this. Yeah. His, his love. Yeah. yeah. Well, and really his humility speaks so much mm. to me, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Okay, Lorleen, just if you pass to Lorleen in front of you. Yeah. Um, it refers to uh, the section about to drive the sinner to salvation. Um, I was brought up in a Catholic church and uh, apart from my parents making me feel like I'm a sinner, I had all the church. And I, I guess um, a lot of my wrath to God is that um, why did I get put in this system and it's all his fault and yeah. um, and I've just decided to blame God for uh, why I've got into an upside down world and um, can you see how we're so quick and I'm guilty of this too we're so quick to blame God yeah. for things that others have done to us God hasn't done it God's been there loving us the whole time yeah. And other people have used their will to make us feel small or horrible. Um, but because often we don't want to feel the pain of those people making us feel small and horrible, we just put it all out on God. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Fred has had the same, perhaps not the same circumstances, but the same where he's been condemned. Yes. But what I felt was that um, he still decided to use his own feelings. So when I say, oh, well, I, I didn't have a chance... I still had my own feelings yeah. and um, he took that through his humility um, to feel in any case yes. and, and go through that way and take what come, whatever he deserved. That's how he was taking it. Yes. And again, it brings me to the humility when you trust or trust yourself because he does. He trusts himself even yeah. though it might bring him to hell or whatever. Yeah. And um, it just made it clearer how I've used God so much as my scapegoat for the problems I've had in my life, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, yeah, I think that's a really good point, Lorleen, because how many of us, like, decry our responsibility because we've had it hard, you know. 
lots of us. <laughs> and Enrique asks a really good question, which I think I should put to you guys to answer, and then we can work through it. He said, um, how truly innocent and good were these souls to arrive where they did? Were they without lust and anger and deceit? Were people of better soul condition on average then than they are now, thanks to morality being less important now? What do you think the answer to that question is? Because it, it, it's going to link to what you were talking about, Lillian. We'll come to that. Does anyone have any idea? Do you think these people passing then had better soul condition than we have now? <laughs> okay, who says yes? Four? Five? Who says no? Fifty-four? <laughs> I actually think the answer is yes, that they did, because there is this huge sense of rebellion very commonly in our society against any kind of control over our behaviour, any kind of sense of... Because so many people, I guess in Fred's day, were made to feel small and shameful, there's a huge rebellion now of, uh, well, that's it, I'm on my own and I can sleep with whoever I want, I can... Uh, you know the world... I don't know how many times I've heard that, all the world's just like that. I have a friend who's a journalist and... Um, when a lot of the stuff happened in the media with AJ and I, um, we had lunch with her and I was saying, you know, these guys, they just completely lied about us. They completely switched everything that we said around. It's just they said the opposite to what we actually are. And she said, well, if you're going to talk to a current affair, what can you expect? And can you see the emotion behind that sentiment? It's very prevalent. If you think about it, in, we almost blame the victim so often because we say, well, there's no morals, that there's, there's no good, you can't expect to be good. And I will make, I will make, um, oh, what's the word that I want to use? I will modify myself to fit in with this injured world. I will make um, concessions, if you like, to what I think is good and right. Because, well, if you don't, you're never going to win anyway. So... There, I feel there is like a, almost an anger at morality in our society, which does affect the way in which we pass a lot. Yeah, Lorleen? Um I did have this question myself as to um, were they in a better condition, and um, I was just wondering that Fred, being who he was with his humility, uh, did was in a better state. But he, this story reflects um, the people that surround him. And the question I had was, oh, aren't there a lot of other people who are not in his state? Where do they go? And yeah. their story is different. And, you know, there's a whole lot in the first chapter that came up about, oh, we're talking about Fred's life and, and his soul con uh, attractions, you know, yes. like who is around him. So um, when you asked the question, uh, were there less moral or more moral, I, I, I would have thought this, they were the same because... Um, for different reasons we have, um, yeah. Yeah, look, I think there was a lot of people entering the hells. A lot of the people that he references who were in the churches and preaching um, these things that made people feel terribly afraid and ashamed, certainly many of them, and many of them hypocritical, um, so acting as if they are very spiritual but actually sinning hugely themselves. So I'm not saying nobody entered the hells, but I am saying that... Um, I feel that there, that there was more of an emphasis on um, moral behaviour because there is also another thing, isn't there? I can have an, an issue of error within me and I can have that within me and I can act on it or I can not act on it. Now, which puts me in a worse soul condition? What? When I act, doesn't it? The error is still with me. And it's still going to keep me away from God and from, you know, the higher realms. But when I act on it, it makes things, like, much worse. So this is why I, I sort of have the feeling. And I don't want to bring AJ into it because <laughs> I'm relying too much on him. But I, I tend to think he agrees with me on that point. Yeah, babe, please. <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah, I'm willing to be a lot more blunt than you are, perhaps. Um, oh, okay. <coughs> yep. If you look at the soul condition of the average 16-year-old in today's world and then compared that with the soul condition of the average 16-year-old 100 years ago, you would find there'd be a substantial difference. Um, well, many 16-year-olds now would have been drunk, uh, uh, slept with people, had yep. abortions. Yep. Um, they've been exposed to a lot of often illegal behaviour. Yep. Yep. And uh, if you can, so if you compare those two things, which is really a measure of how our society is, you would see that uh, while 100 years ago people were more suppressed, they certainly didn't um, generally, there was a, and these are general generalisations, but generally people 100 years ago that we observed, uh, the average 16-year-old would pass into a relatively good condition in the first sphere where you could help them quite easily to progress, whereas the average 16-year-old uh, nowadays would pass into the hells in a much more difficult condition to progress and with a much stronger feelings of rebellion and uh, desire to do their own thing and to be lawless. And in fact, what we often observe now in comparison is even five-year-olds have huge amounts of rebellion uh, in them now because of, because of the parents having, coming, having come from a feeling of suppression they've then allowed their children to do almost anything, which has is, which is now caused their children to have quite a poor soul condition as a result. And so um, the reality is from our observation, because we have that ability to observe 100 years ago and compare, them, <laughs> compare with today, uh, what we see is that uh, the actual condition of mankind today from a moral condition is much, much worse. From a feeling condition, it's actually better in the sense that they are closer to their true emotional feelings. But, uh, but unfortunately, the morality, the choices they've made out of harmony with love have degraded their condition so much. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's that strong sense of entitlement, isn't it, babe, that we mm. often see in people that really impedes th their learning, uh, their growth, their desire to love because they feel everyone else should be giving them something. Yeah. yeah, and you, you can even feel it even in our group here, there is a lar still large amounts of blame of other people for their, for their sadness mm -hmm. when the reality is almost all of our sadness that's inside of us is, not, is related to the law of compensation based on what we've done to treat other people badly. So <laughs> the reality is that we, we still don't understand, many of us, that the, the majority of our sadness that's inside of us right now doesn't come from how we were treated as a child, but rather comes from our choices and behaviour since that time that have been out of harmony with love that have an automatic penalty on our soul from the law of compensation. Yeah. And most of us still don't realise that because we're focusing almost totally our effort on trying to connect with childhood emotions resulting into how other people have damaged us and ve but very few of us are connecting very strongly with how much we have damaged other people. Yeah. Mm. Oh, and, and that's something, if you remember last week, we talked about the small child and he, how beautiful his condition was. And I said, it, you know, it's the actions we take to avoid the damage that's been done to us in our childhood that severely degrade our soul condition, which is what AJ's referring to. And this is why, and I'm... Certainly still walking this path. I haven't reached this destination, but I do have really strong feelings about repentance because the process of repentance begins with us connecting to the harm that we've done to other people, wanting to, to feel the pain that I've caused my soulmate. That is the beginning point. And that is really the true, like, the resistance we have to repentance it shows the resistance we have to true humility. You know, now that process of repentance would lead me down to the to the shame and the hurt that I was avoiding in taking those actions. But if I do it in the methodology, if you like, of repentance, I'm going to heal an awful lot. And I'm going to have to face some big blocks and resistance to begin with. But it will actually... This is what I'm learning, I feel, in these last months. Is This is what is actually going to 
make me into a truly humble person, a loving person. So, yeah. Uh, if we go to Alwyn and then to Nat, because you had your hand up for a bit, yeah. After reading this chapter again, um, I had a very disturbed night and in the morning I just woke up and it was like that. I felt um, like a poison, like it was like a, a, a black poison inside of me of, of all the unloving, demanding, selfish things that I've treated, the way I've treated others and, and have expected things from others. It was... I wanted to vomit it up. I just felt yeah. so bad and sort of remorseful and I don't know if I got to repentance, but it certainly felt... It really, really brought up everything that you're saying. Yeah. Just because... I think also because he talks about motivation and, and I looked at the motivations of a lot of the stuff that I'd done. Awesome. You know, yeah. that God sees those motivations. Yeah. 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 Beautiful, Alan. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I feel that what this chapter talks to us about is the law of compensation a lot. It talks about the rewards, but it also talks about the law of compensation on our soul. And, and I think I said last week that I have a firm belief that as we open up emotionally, we begin to feel the law of compensation operating upon us here while we're on earth. We don't have to wait for the spirit world. And I think that your story demonstrates just... I don't even feel that you're at repentance yet, but you're beginning to feel the law of compensation, which is the really God's, I forget how AJ calls it, but you know, it's a very fine grinding thing that sees everything. And um, if we can get really real about these motivations and these things that we've done, I see, yeah, we can begin to feel what it's really doing to us. And that's, that's when we have the most potential to change yeah yeah Nat um I'm not sure if you can answer this Mary but when I was reading in the chapter about how the residents go through the mists and then bring people back um it was good that you talked about the morality because then I understand that where they're going is a reflection of their soul condition but um for people who are entering the hells are they afforded the same explanation are they received in the same way Yes, and I believe that the book demonstrates... I'm rereading as we go as well. I re read this a while ago. But I believe in the, one of the coming chapters we get to see someone who goes to the hells, yeah. but they were received in the same way. Yeah. And, I have a and remember also, this is what I can say about the, the spirit world, is that it's... And Helen says it in, in this chapter. She says... He asked, well, is there a hell? And she said, well, yes, there are hells worse than you can even imagine, but they're designed to purify you. So everything is done so that you would grow in love, not that you would be punished. And so for that reason, anyone who asks, anyone ever who asks in the spirit world receives an answer, including those people going to the hells. So then for spirits who have never entered the spirit world and are earthbound... Why is it that they... What? Um... Well, that's the other thing I was going to say. Many spirits who enter the hells would not ask a question because they lack humility. Okay. And so many spirits who remain here on earth lack the humility even to want to see their soul condition. And um, I think it talks about in the Life of Elysian how when a spirit is still earthbound, they're still carrying out these like these addictive desires or these punishing des or whatever these unloving desires they haven't finished with it yet they still want to keep going with that and it's only when they come to the point of saying that's enough now that they actually enter the spirit world okay yeah cool can i ask a question about one of the paragraphs here um he says at the moment at that could moment, you tell us which page it's on sorry, it's on page 11 and in which, are you in a printout or uh, a book? I'm in a book. Yeah. And um, Helen has just thanked him. And um, she, he says, thank me for what I asked in astonishment. I need not tell you that, she answered. Our father knows and he will repay you. At that moment, I found that heaven is quite as much a condition of the soul as a locality. And true friendship is a great factor in completing that condition. I just, I don't quite understand sure, what the friendship... Sure, that's a good question. 
Oh, about the friendship? Yeah, let's talk about the first part of it as well. Heaven is quite as much a condition of, a soul, as, of the soul as a locality. Is that a truth? Yeah, because we can be in the soul condition of heaven on earth. However, it's not the full truth because heaven, the celestial heavens, is actually a locality. So it's actually not a truth, but I think it's demonstrating how overwhelmed he is. He, this is how humble this man is. He hasn't been met by... He's been met by a passing acquaintance who he knew on earth and he is completely overwhelmed that he so much joy that he feels he's in heaven. The, tr- the truth is he's got so much more to go and, and it, at, in, in the end of the trilogy he actually reaches heaven but um, he's just so humble to be so overwhelmed. So I, I can't quite agree with his metaphor. I, I do believe that we can reach at one moment here on earth so in that way but we, our, soul, our soul is really residing then in the celestial heaven so it is a location. Uh, and true friendship is a great factor in completing that condition. So what's your question, Nat? Is that a truth or what, what's your feeling about it? Well, I just I felt a bit confused about how his friendship with this woman has played a part in that condition. Yeah. So... I mean, I, I, get, <laughs> I get that... From a moral perspective, he's assisted her and, and helped her in some way, in, in some small way. Yeah. Um, but he, he's talking about it being a factor in completing the condition. Well, I feel he's just saying... Well, let's hear from Rita, because sure. she, she <laughs> feels like she knows, and then let's talk about it more as a bigger group. Yeah. When I read it at home, I didn't understand that either. Thank me for what I ask in astonishment. But just now I had the insight... He said, it says later, um, she wanted to know the children would be safe. And when I gave her a solemn promise, she grew calm and closed her eyes in peace. So he must have looked after her children. Well, he, he made sure that they were okay. So, yes, yeah. but you, you're missing the point of, no, you're I'm not missing listening the point. well. Yes. <laughs> She's thanking him for the kindness that he showed her on earth. Yes, but he's so humble, he's saying, what are you talking about? And she's saying, it's okay, God sees how good you are. But Nat's question is about how does friendship get you to heaven? That's really the question, isn't it? (laughs) Um, I don't actually feel that friendship alone gets you to heaven. (laughs) I feel that he's saying, basically saying, I'm so overwhelmed that I'm seeing, and this is a true friend. So perhaps we could ask, what is a true friend? Nat? I guess it would be someone who doesn't demand or expect anything from you and is just there for you when you need so them. Someone who loves you unconditionally. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and he's feeling like, wow, I'm so overwhelmed to see this person. I feel like I'm in heaven and this, this is because I'm seeing a true friend right here in front of me. I don't know if there's much deeper meaning than that. Okay. I feel that when we learn to love one, each, one another in true friendship, this does a lot for our soul condition, um, if you want to look at it that way. So but the factor of completing the condition perhaps is his true friendship to her in her moment of need, maybe? Or am I just complicating it? Yeah, I don't know. I feel like we're getting a bit complicated about it. He's, he's talking about the condition of the soul as heaven and he's saying that true friendship is a factor in completing it, so that condition. So they've been true friends to each other, um, but I, I don't know that... Um, so unconditional love is the factor yeah. in completing it. Yeah. AJ's looking at me with these looks and I, it's, I'm like... <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> He's going, babe, you, you're not on the mark. So I can feel him. <laughs> so I'm missing the mark. Anyone else? Yep. <laughs> I'm happy to say that. Um, I'm feeling that God is truly the only true friend in that sense. So the more godlike I am and the more at one I am with God the better friend I can be to myself and others. Yeah, so, okay, I think, we, I think we're getting really heady about this, you know. I think that 
we can have true friends. We, at present, perhaps our only true friend is God, but we can be true friends to one another. And we need to stop making excuses for the fact that we can't be true friends to each other. You know, <laughs> true friends love each other without investment in the other person. So um, I get a little bit concerned when everyone goes, oh, I've got lots of error, I can't love you. That's wrong. <laughs> that's the thing that's going to keep you in the hells. So um, if we go to Tim, and I, I really think that, that he's just feeling overwhelmed emotionally. and He's saying, wow, this feels like heaven and I've met this friend and that's why I feel like it. But Tim, go for yeah, it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's like his friend being there was completing his condition of happiness. Absolutely. Of being, feeling like he's in yes. heaven. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what, he just feels really happy and he's saying it in a poetic way. Kel? Um, just um, he feels his sister's love, that part where from him helping her and her children, um, that the connection that they have, then he feels that and she feels that and that's the connection, it's a simple Yeah, love. they just have a common love and respect for each other, don't they? Yeah. But keep in mind, they weren't bosom buddies on earth. They, they were just, yeah, acquaintances. Rita? I feel that the true friendship is just because he helped her. And true friendship is, I don't have to be your friend or know you. I can be a true friend to anybody, even if I pick up a hitchhiker and talk to him or listen to him. Then there is a true friendship. If So uh, yeah, a, a true uh, friendship is when it's deeds and work and not uh, words. So it comes later with that Om, Omra, who was in prison and he helped Bob or... So true friendship isn't restricted to that I know that person. No, that no, it's not. But true friendship is definitely about love and not just deeds. It yeah. is deeds yeah. driven by love. Dr deeds yes. driven by love. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I think there's lots of lessons for you, Rita, personally about that. <laughs> that we could talk about afterwards if you like. About, yeah, yeah. Uh Suze? One of the things that I think is really beautiful about this is it demonstrates how much feeling is our pathway. When you said before um, that you know immediately when you've done something good or you haven't done something good, and I wonder if friendship isn't a feeling quality more than a commitment to one person. It's like... Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It's I, like, I think so. Know, like um, it's, it's, it's lovingness in a moment. Like... I. I feel in my body, the moment I've been a bit angry or I've had a nasty thought or anything, my, every cell in my body knows. And it's the same, you know, if, if in a moment there's been a thought that you care more about the other person or just whatever it is, a moment of seeing God in a, in a lady beetle is, is that, that quality of love. And I think that's what friendship is. It doesn't need to be a lifetime commitment. No, I agree. That's similar to what Rita was saying as well, yeah. that... We, friendship can be extended to everyone and if we yeah. love it will be really <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so yeah thanks Suze yeah. okay are we still on fr I think we'd like to move on from friendship although it seems like there's a lot of feelings about friendship out there do you off do you feel like friendship is a contract or something no no yeah yeah I yeah I think it'd be good to just if we just keep summarising the chapter and if you guys raise your hand with any bits that you found particularly um, powerful in terms of how this um, connects with your life or the tr or truths that it's demonstrating or things that you didn't understand. Okay, so where are we up to? Um, he's still just talking about his desire to go back, isn't he? And talking about how wonderful it is, the place that he's come to. And then he meets Helen. And we hear the story about how he met Helen and that she had been someone who was very poor, who lost her mother, who then took on the care of her whole family. And he met her on her deathbed. So... 
and he, he ensured her that he, also, he obviously was true to this feeling he had about love. He assured her that things would be loving, that God is loving, and um, that he would take care that, her children, that the children were looked after. And now he's having a discussion with Helen and he says, it always appeared to me that whatever was done for love's sake could not be wrong. So what did you guys reflect on about that statement? How does that relate to our lives? How much consideration do we give to that fact? Joy, yep. We just maybe, Anto, could you bring your mic over? Because this one's not working. Yeah. Right. Um, yes, it just put me back to what we were talking about before about repentance. Like to realise that in, in my, in following on my whole of my life, um, there are many things that I've done for power and glory and manipulation and competition and all of those other things probably far outweigh the things that I've done that were just for love yes yeah yeah Yeah. and and how many of us connect to well how many of us um and are about what the right thing or the wrong thing is to do yeah lots of people and you can see that if we connected with this one truth is this about love and we were very sincere in our desire to understand if it's loving we we quickly um we quickly cut down what you know we quickly get to the heart of the matter barbara um, ever since I was little, I always had this um, knowing, and I don't know where from, um, that love always wins, you know, love conquers all. It was just a belief I always had. Life, you know, sort of buried that a little bit for me, but it would surface every now and again throughout my life that, yes, true love, and I know I got love mixed up sometimes in my life, as we all did, what true love is, um, but he believed that yeah. and that's coming through in here um, yeah. that um, – and this is the message that came back to me that um, the love does always win at the end of the day. Although we don't see it and we don't see love on earth, there is a huge amount of love here if we just took the time to feel it and see it and believe it and have faith that God is love. Yeah, and you and know the way that love wins? It's only when we're loyal to the principles of love. Yes. When we decide to love, then love has the capacity it's through us to win, doesn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. But yeah. how many of us avoid that? Yes, <laughs> and I'm just really feeling that in my life now. Yeah. And as a little church girl, I knew that. Yeah. I knew that. I used to sit and look at my Sunday school books and they were just pretty pictures of, you know, Jesus and Mary and, and all of those things and the little tales and that. But I just knew looking at them that love was was the answer to everything. Mm-hmm. But as life went on, I really forgot what that really meant. Yeah, yeah. well, and there he's, was... And he's showing that to me now in yeah. this. Yeah, awesome. Okay, let's let's press on because I'd like to get to some, some parts, some Bible quotations that he um, references, but also some more of your reflections on your own personal lives, what you saw from this chapter. Okay, and the truths. Who, who's made a note of the truths that they've, they saw in this chapter? Yeah, Deb, do you want to share some of them? There is a lot, actually. So if we just hear a few from you and then we... Um, thanks, babe. Thank uh, there is no death. There is no need of fear, fear death. Yep. There is love and hope. Um, Afra, um, just what we've already discussed, Afra's um, immediate prayer for mankind, um, demonstrating his habit of fit prayer, his faith in God, his habit and intense desire to serve, his selflessness. So, Deb, now we're getting weight. We're getting. We're talking about Fred. We want to talk about God's truth. So what are the issues of universal truth that we demonstrated? The start of what you were saying was yeah. right, but just so that we can... Um, yeah. Look, guys, this is a total learning curve for me, but I feel like um, I don't want to be in control of everything that happens. But if we can stick to um, really what the questions are asking, uh, 
then we're going to, I think, get a lot more from, from mm. the group together. So I, I'm trying to find the balance between a uh, flowing discussion between all of us, but also really answering, like when we ask, what are the issues of God's truth that I see in this chapter? That's different from what are the qualities I see in Fred? Oh, Do you I, see the difference? I think, it's, I think that these are qualities of truth. I might not have the discernment that you've got. Well, from. you're not stating them as qualities of truth. Oh. If that, um, so what you said about Fred, what did you say about Fred? You said that he's praying. Well, um, yeah, okay, it gets more into what he's doing that works for him. Yeah, so you're seeing what works for Fred. So how would we phrase that in terms of God's truth? Oh, to me, it demonstrated the value of having... Faith in God, a habit of prayer, relationship with God already here, you know, in the yeah, yeah, now. Yeah. Um, so can... Uh, dis- service? Yeah. Desire to serve, all those but things. Can you see how they are soul qualities as opposed to God's truths? Oh, okay. Oh, y- yep. Next, I just wrote down everything I saw was the truth. Is um, the the church had it, had it wrong about yep. the afterlife? Um, the Fre- Frederick's willing to be honest, even if he's wrong. It. Um, yep. So. Back to him again. Okay. Yeah. Can you see how we can look at that and say, okay, humility is rewarded in heaven. That might be a God's mm. truth. But mm. if we're just talking about Fred, we're just talking about Fred. It's okay. Let's move on. Dave, did you want to? <laughs> um, yeah, there's quite a few. There's heaps, actually. There's tons yeah. in there. Um, yeah. One of God's laws of love are unchangeable. Yep. Um, so how did we see that in the chapter? Uh, the location when you enter the... Oh, I was reading something else he wrote in there. That's, that's um, when spirits come there, they're given their own message on earth. And when they come there, it's quite different. It's yep. like probational and remedial rather than um, punishing. Yep. And yep. He found that out. So we're seeing there was no that judgment sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So we're seeing that it doesn't matter what you believe on earth, God's laws are going to be what they are when you get to heaven. Yeah. No yeah when you get to no the spirit what you world, we should so. say. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. There's going. more. Um, yeah. Uh, where are we? There's one about when you. Going through the mist is when it dissolves all the facade and everything's seen, you're exposed. Yes, yeah. That's there. a beautiful truth from this mm. chapter, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And whatever a man sows, a man shall reap. It was yeah. in there. Yeah, and that's a... Did, it, who, did anyone look that up in the Bible? Yeah? <laughs> no? Yeah? Barbara? Did you, did you want to read it? Did you bring it this week? No. no. Okay. So let's talk about that. Um... So that's from James, James 2. No, it's not, sorry. It's Galatians. No, it's Galatians. I've got the wrong. James is in another part. Yeah. So it says, Do not be misled. God is not one to be mocked. For whatever a man is sowing, this he will also reap. Because he who is sowing with a view to his flesh will reap corruption from his flesh. But he who is sowing with a view to the spirit will reap everlasting life from the spirit. So that's pretty nice. Um, That's really the message of this whole chapter, isn't it? Yeah. What does he mean, Dave, by um, he who is sowing with a view to his flesh will reap corruption from his flesh? Um, I guess um, focusing on the material word rather than your soul. Yeah, when he's focusing on his um, his um, earthly desires, I suppose, when he's yeah. when he's um, sowing in order to get things for his earthly status or serving. addictions or whatever. But what he who is sowing with a view to the spirit will reap everlasting life in the spirit. So, sorry. Yeah, and so he, that's where he's thinking of himself as God's child, as a spiritual being. And there's a beautiful quote in here, isn't there, about that? Does anyone have that one marked? Um, 
it's about that men should, as spiritual beings, I have marked it. I've got so one sort of summarised. Yeah, yeah. Another one, the laws, kind of in a way that um, that it's a spiritual condition of a person on earth that should have priority over its learning and investigation. Yes. Is that the one? Yep, that's it exactly. It's on page fifteen of the printout, and um, Helen's talking to him about a great error which should be corrected. Man practically regards the earth life as the chief rather than the subordinate condition of existence. As a spiritual being, he should be educated to look upon everything from a spiritual standpoint. Which makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Does everyone get what that means? Yeah. Nina? Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Um, for me, that paragraph highlighted um, how God has designed this earthly existence initially really, um, I don't know, like it really is a kindergarten and how little we know. And I feel for myself that I've placed so much importance on all the wrong things because this is all that I've known. Yeah. Y yep. Yeah. So it's like a totally, um, yeah, just an overinflated importance on, on, the, on the wrong things. Yes. Yeah, yep, yeah. Yep. And you know how you said it's the kindergarten because we don't know very much. Um, I feel that that's where if we become more like Fred, God has actually designed everything around us that we would come to know the truth. Do you see what I'm saying? Is that if we, if we maintain some very basic soul qualities that for most of us were squashed by the time we were three or four, but these, this really um, innocent desire to learn and know and to learn about love and to grow as people, if we, if we had kept that within us while we're on earth, we would have learnt so much about God by the time we're 12, hey? Because we, you know, our hearts would be open to every lesson that would the law of attraction, no one would have had to write it up on a whiteboard, would have gone, uh, we would have felt it, yeah, yeah, so. It's a beautiful thing, I think, this is like the nursery of the soul as God, as God, as AJ calls it, um, but God has designed it in a way that um, we learn about the use of our will so much here, like, and if we, if we have the integrity to use our will in harmony with love, there are so many rewards. And, but because we're here on earth, we don't always get the immediate feedback in terms of our spiritual condition, do we? We have to be sensitive, feeling heart. But if we can do that, if we can maintain that, then the rewards there are amazing, but also the rewards in our life here on earth. It's when we use our will in the opposite direction in terms of error that God has also created it that we would come to see it, but it's a slower process than if we're in the spiritual world because we see it immediately. We, the consequence is more immediate. And so God has given us more responsibility here, I feel, about how am I going to use my will because there might not be an immediate pain upon me, although, as we said, if we're sensitive, we will feel it. But if, if I can, just out of the pure desire to love there's nothing in it for me just out of the pure desire to love, use my will in harmony with truth and love, then that is a very beautiful quality that we have the potential to, to develop here. Because once we go to the spirit world, whenever we use our um, will out of a pure desire to love, we have the immediate knowledge and reward for that. Whereas here, it takes um, a lot of uh, will and integrity, I feel. Yeah. Okay, Renee, if we go to Renee, I haven't heard from her today. Do you know why it was created that way? Like, why here it's that sort of lag? Um, I think it's for the very reason I just tried to describe. I don't think I can describe it very clearly, but it's because if we... There's a certain quality of faith and integrity that if we develop here on earth will serve us for the rest of our soul's journey and it, it will come through our pure desire here, if we develop it here more than anywhere else 
um, there's got to be a lot of will and desire to do it that way. And so if we do that, that is a very strong quality that we've developed while we're here on earth that will mean everything that comes after will be a breeze. Yeah. Um, there's something else I wanted to say about that, but it's just gone out of my head. Yeah. Oh, that's what it was. It wasn't designed also to be such a fear-driven place. It's man's use of their own will which is exactly, this is all designed, this whole earth sphere to for help us understand our will. <laughs> Do you see that? Yeah. yeah. I um, sort of find it a bit challenging to understand that it's taken, like, so many people have missed out on the truth and we're so lucky to have yourself and AJ here teaching us again. Um, so then I don't understand how it's how the infant how it's loving but slow <laughs> Just, mm. uh, could you give me more information about this question <laughs> like if like how many people aren't aware of the truth yet may have been seeking but the wrong truth and then so from what you know about God, though, Renee, what do you feel when we have a sincere desire for truth? What happens? We generally know the answer. Well, we, we are offered the, the truth, aren't we? Now, sometimes we might have the sincere desire for truth. It arrives and then go, oh, no, that's not what I thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's a deeper level to what you're asking me, which is about why we're here now and we haven't been here before, perhaps. Um, just about how many people have missed out on truth that have lived and been on this earth for 2,000 years yet have got a really distorted sense of truth. Yeah. Like what um, Fred is so passionate about letting everyone know. Yeah. Can you see that... Um that when we know the truth and we are loving, we do really want to help people avoid the pain of not knowing the truth. So there has been a lot of people, yes, us, but a lot of people like Fred, there's been a lot of effort on the planet from the, the spiritual realms to try to bring truth to people here on earth. Yeah. And many people who have had a sincere desire for truth, have gained some truth. Like Fred, he knew, no, God is loving. This is not right because he really sought to know in his heart. So, yeah, yeah. If you just go behind you to Nat. Um, God's truth about grace, my favourite, um, who then can be saved. Um, we hope that every individual child will be ultimately and... I think if one shall be accepted, it will be his own fault entirely. Yeah. It's beautiful, hey? So Helen's saying to him that we, there's no one, there's no special ones. We want everyone to, to have the benefit of God's grace. And I feel a heap of gratitude for that. Yeah. It's beautiful, hey? Yeah. And she says, I think if one shall be accepted, it will be his own fault entirely, which means what? <coughs> what is she referring to there? Ange? Your own free will? Yeah. So they would be using their will in opposition to it. Yeah. Jeez. Okay, Barbara. Um, another um, beautiful um, God's truth um, yep. is um, honest will is always accepted by God as if the deed had been successfully performed. Yeah. Now, that really brought it home to me because we and me, I know throughout my life, have thought, oh, my circumstances won't allow me to do that, but, you know, I'd really like to do that. Um, but that hasn't been an honest will. Yeah. Um, so, and then also, too, it means that all men are equal because if a, if a wealthy man had the honest will to do something and did it, but a poor man still had the same honest will to do it, but had no circumstances to do it. But 
in God's eyes, they're equal yeah. and they're equally, equally rewarded, rewarded for that. Yeah. That yeah. is a beautiful truth. That is a beautiful truth. It's such a beautiful truth from this chapter. And um, it, how does that relate to our... Who related that to your life right now? What does that mean to you? Yeah. Deidre, what did you feel about that in terms of your life right now? Um, oh, I, I just... Um, oh, sorry. I just uh, put it like to my... Like for, I've been miserable for, like, for a lot of years and... For like about 15 years, I would donate to the Salvation Army, like under the Christmas wish tree. Yeah. And um, but it wasn't coming from a pure place. It was I was doing it to try and make myself feel better, even though you might think, oh, that's lovely, but it wasn't really that lovely. Yeah. So you could see that actually, that wasn't an honest will. That no. was There was something in it for you. No. Yeah. So and it's like it's all balanced out. So yeah. even though that was a lovely gesture. But because my intentions weren't pure, it yeah. counts as zero. And I thought that was what they were trying to say as well. well it, it, like it balances out. Like you don't get a brownie point for that because it... Well, because if you were doing it for a selfish <laughs> purpose, you actually gave nothing. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's what God sees. God yeah. sees that, oh, when Deidre did that, she wanted something for herself and not to give to, something, to somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I suspect for you there was a mixture of things going on and God sees that too. So. But don't you say you can't, uh, truth and love on the same subject can't reside at the same time? Truth and love on the oh, same... Oh, sorry, truth and error can't reside in the same topic at the same time within you? Yes. So the whole truth about your will and using your will lovingly was not within you at yes, that time. Yeah. 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 Okay, Elaine. Thank you. Um, faith without works is dead. Yeah. Um, really brought it to me because you try and have this faith and sit in faith, but if you don't do something about it, the faith really, it's just, a belief it's not yeah that really and hit home well what do you think about the idea that f- real faith would lead us to works um yeah but it quotes there that jesus says in as much as he did it not believed it so yeah i guess though faith eventually gets you to step forward and move into love um, because the other thing that was obvious to me is um, nothing but love and noble deeds are able to enter this life in company with the soul. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a few things that I would say about that. Um, let's read the chapter, that, the verse from the Bible to put it in context. The faith without works is dead. You see that a man is to be declared righteous by works and not by faith alone. So it's not saying that if you have faith, it's worth nothing. It's saying that, that a man to, would be declared righteous by works. So what he does with his faith. Do you understand the difference? So they're not saying that um, faith is worthless. And that's why I asked the question about faith drawing you to works. Because I believe that if if you have faith in a loving God, that that will lead you to do certain things which demonstrate that belief. Yeah. I guess I was thinking more from a healing point of view, just sitting there in faith without um, being willing to actually do so. That's where I was put that particular subject. I agree. and this, this idea that we passively have faith and we passively love people, is it, it's, that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, but thank you for adding that yeah. extra no worries. truth for me. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to say one more thing about what, nothing but love and noble deeds are, are able to enter this life in company with the soul. Is that from the text? Can anyone tell me the page that's on? Oh, yeah. 
Nothing but love and noble deeds are able to enter this life in company with the soul. All forms of belief are lost in yonder mists. So he's saying there that we might believe that we're going to go and sit at the right hand of Jesus or whatever, but it's not going to fly when, once you get there. This is, what, this, is how, this is how it's going to look. Now, nothing but love and noble deeds are to enter this life in company with the soul. Do you agree with that statement? If we go to Elaine. The colour of your robe or um, outer covering yeah. would show that, um, you know, any pretense if, or just the belief that you acted in love. And, yes. And the noble to me is noble, not arrogant or yes. wanting something for yourself. Like just to be truly noble is... To be really humble? Yeah, it's to have a, a sincere desire that is loving. Yeah, that's a noble desire. But do, do you think that we just pass through the mist with only... Now, our robes display our condition in love, don't they? But it doesn't mean we get to ditch all the things that we did that were out of harmony with love. They're still with us, aren't they? Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that in the statement. Yeah. yeah. They, they will balance it. So the colour won't allow you to go through unless it's pure love and... Yeah, well, our condition of love, and that's another truth, isn't it, is going to be reflected in the robes that we're wearing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Sandra? Um, some of the things that I've learned was... Um, that um, there is no time frame in when you pass, which is something that triggers me because I'm always out of, like, I feel like there is no time. On earth, it feels like, oh, my God, I'm out of time. Yeah. But when he passed, he wasn't aware of what... Time was ...what happened, there, how long it? he was there yeah. on, the, yeah. on, the, you know, on the slope. And that's beautiful because there is no time with God. There's eternity, and that's really beautiful. Yeah. Time still passes, but it's in a different way. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. it's like... Yeah, there's an emotion about, you know, not having enough time or on earth feeling, oh, we're going to, we've got this much time and then we die. So we've got to do everything, you know, and then you feel disappointment. All that sort of stuff gets triggered just by feeling about time on earth. Which, yeah. 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 So can you see that the, why do you think you panic about there not being enough time? Uh, I think just being raised on time. Yeah, you know, I, think there's, I think there's a deeper feeling about God and punishment and things like that, isn't there? Yeah, in, inherent yeah. In that. but if yeah. you don't do it in that amount of... And just yeah. like, I think educationally as well, everything's a deadline. So you live yeah. your life according to deadlines. You and know? what do you get at the deadline? Sorry? What happens at the deadline? Yeah, if you don't perform, you get judged. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's so all about it's judgment. About yeah. 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 yeah, fearing yeah. judgment yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, some of the other ones that were really beautiful were like, um, oh, yeah, that there is no one to judge us. It is who we who judge ourselves. That, you know, when you pass, it's, it's just our own emotions that we have towards ourselves, that there's really no judgment of anyone, like anyone. Well, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because he asks Helen about the judgment hall, doesn't he? And then yeah. she says, you've already passed through the judgment so is there judgment or isn't there judgment? Well, I guess the judgment is the, the robe that you're wearing, that you get, is the kind of like you just get put into where your place is according to your soul condition. So it's kind of, in a way we could call it judgment, but really it's just a, a loving way of... Yeah, I guess the truth that is displayed in the chapter is that God sees everything in our soul and that there is a law of compensation that does act upon our soul. So when we, when we do um, things to harm other people, that will have an impact on our soul. Not just the way we feel about it, but the way they felt when we did it yeah. will be within our soul, which is so, a very important uh, thing to consider in your own... Remember, we're always bringing this back to how does this impact on my own life? Yeah. How does that truth impact on yeah. your life? And I've actually been going through this right now, like just feeling how unloving I am in a relationship and how much anger I choose to go into when my demands are not being met and the pain of it that it brings that is just the beginning of repentance. But when it's not full and it's just remorse or guilt, you know you're going to do it again. And to be in this constant circle of 
I hate you, I punish you for what you're doing to me, you know, in rage, and then feeling the, how it really hurts the other person and how it much it hurts you, your own soul. Yeah. And then just still wanting to be in that place constantly, you know, rather than yeah. choosing. I do, it's, it kind of feels like, what do I choose, you know? It feels like I have no will to choose. Yeah. And that's Which is a true. big... Yeah. This is our problem, isn't it? Remember we talked about earlier how we want to decry the, our responsibility for our own soul, especially at this mm. time in history, you know. Well, that's the way the world is. Well, what else can I do? I can't possibly feel, so I'm just going to have to do it again. And it's very dangerous territory yeah. in terms of our soul. And what I thought about when, when reading this chapter was not only about this huge, um, beautiful demonstrations of service that we see, these truly humble people with Fred and the, the factory worker at the end, and even Helen to some degree, but was about how... Do you remember AJ gave a talk once and he talked about our soul condition, how when we get into a state of humility, we might grieve. We might even grieve some of the things we've done against other people or grieve harm that's been done to us and, and our soul condition improves. That might happen at 8 o'clock in the morning. At 10 o'clock in the morning, something might happen. We have a choice. How are we going to act? Mm -hmm. Now, how we act very much depends, is very much going to influence what happens with this little soul condition graph. And this is what I thought about in this chapter what is, what is happening with my soul on a day to, moment to moment, day to day basis? Because this is what God sees. It doesn't matter how many stories I tell myself about, I really want to be a good person, I really want to love, or, you know, I really do want to serve, but I'm just not ready yet, or I'm a bit afraid of what people will think of me. God sees the works, and God sees the intentions behind the works. And if I choose to um, be immoral, be angry, be, that's that's what impacts on my soul and there is a law of compensation for those things yeah and I love how um Afra he or Frederick he just he's willing to go into the place where he feels if there was error that he's willing to feel that error you know he's willing to go to hell whereas when I ask and pray God so much for receiving the truth and then when I get it I choose to actually be angry about it. God shows me every time, like, this is what you've been praying for. And I still just go, no, I'm just angry. I'm, I, and I choose it. Like, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. You can feel it, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's beautiful to see him. Like, just triggers me so much to see that it's possible that people do it, that people do choose to always act out of love, you know. It's, yeah. yeah. So it's about what's your choice, hey? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll just run through a few more truths and then I'm going to ask you just some questions about how you related this to your life because I think we're out of time anyway. So, uh, you've covered lots of them. Um, one of the big truths was that judgment is not final but, it's rem but there's remedial things, there's probationary things. Someone might have mentioned that already. Um, that we have a work, a mission to fulfill in heaven. This one comes from Anna in Sweden, which I thought was beautiful. Remember she says, Helen says, there's, all, there's work for everyone here. So that we are workers together with God. That God has placed enough on this earth to supply the needs and give some comforts to every one of his children. Do you remember the passage where it says that? But that man has changed that. Yeah. Yeah, with greed. Okay. And that honest will, as Barb said, is accepted by God as if the deed had been successfully performed, which is very beautiful. Okay. So how did you guys apply this chapter to your own lives? There's so much more that I wanted to talk about and, um, you know, there's so many beautiful aspects to this chapter probably right before we we meet the factory worker and he talks about this the demonstration of that truth that honest will is what god sees and that um, self-sacrificing love to relieve pain distress and want not done to be seen of men but from sympathy with the weak and unfortunate brother the motive which prompts a man to give what he himself may need to lessen the sufferings of another, the patient endurance of wrong until the father determines to avenge, the charity 
which rises to the defense of the weak against the strong, and it goes on. But these are just the beautiful things that God sees within us when we, when we have those things. And these are the things that are rewarded by God. So what, what were your guys' reflections on how this will... Graham. The thing that has really got me going is about give to another what you may need yourself. Um, like I'm okay at giving away what's surplus to my own requirements but when it comes to giving away um, what I feel I need for myself then I've got problems you know and, <laughs> yeah. and like it comes up with the earth changes stuff as well you know like I've got a, got a fear of giving away um, what, what I've prepared for earth changes you know that the multitudes of hungry people I might end up just giving away all my food that I've yeah. stored and stuff like that and end up hungry myself, you know. So yeah. I've got a lot to explore in that area and I haven't come to any conclusions <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Can you see that it's a very pure kind of love that would cause us to do that, isn't it? There can't be a thought of our own fear in that. Do you see? If I'm willing to give you the shoes off my feet, I'm not afraid of how uncomfortable my feet are going to be. I love you that much, or yeah. I'm willing to feel that, own that fear. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah for sure. Yeah. But then also comes up issues of self-love, you know? Like, Absolutely. Am I, am I sacrificing myself for somebody else, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm not sure where to go with this. Yeah. So, Jason, you want to add something to that? Yeah. Uh, I know I have a lot of issues around money, and sometimes when I feel the pain in my chest about I want to, like, I can't afford it, but trying to hang on to it and budget and all that sort of stuff and and, um, and then sometimes I'll let go and go, damn it, I'll just spend the twenty dollars and just really let it go. And then and then sometimes um the money's actually come back. I've actually in fact one time I gave Renee twenty dollars and then a few minutes later I end up making ninety dollars. So I guess it's the faith and that you'll be provided for when you're in that space. Yeah, well there is a lot of issues around faith in God. If we trust that God is good and I'm giving out of a pure loving intention, so I'm not giving out of fear, I'm not giving because I think I should, I'm not giving because... It's because I really love my brother and I, and I feel compelled to give this... compelled from something that's inside of me to give to him from the love inside of me. If, and if I have faith in God, then I know that I'll be provided for as well. Um, it's very much the feeling that we won't be provided for that often prevents us. So this fear, this lack feeling inside of us that prevents us acting in love. Yeah, Tim? Um, yeah, the aspect of faith just brought me back to a quality I noticed in Afra that's starting to develop, which is um, he begins to display, that, display the faith um, that of the order of things. So yes. it's like this faith that actually God who I feel is actually loving God has created this universe, not a man or a conglomerate. It's actually, if I just engage that, then I can actually go to this place in trusting God. And It serves him very well, doesn't it? He does, sees, yeah. he, he's so observant as well, and he's kind of got this thing that he feels that God is loving. And when he arrives, he sees, wow, there's a provision for this, there's a provision for that. The, everyone seems, and so he just trusts that and, yeah. And it grows for him as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Ivana? Um, something that I've noticed um, by reading and just coming along here is just how cold I feel as a person, like, um, and how little it seems that I want to actually love people. And it's like I just want to be angry towards people and judge people. Yeah. And... Um, just with how you've mentioned that the depth of what you see in each chapter, it's like I read it and I feel like, oh, I don't see the things that you all see. And it's so I guess that's where I'm closed at the moment. And it's yeah. like even um, last week, I like I couldn't understand... Um, like, I found it really hard to read the start of the first chapter um, until he started explaining how he died and then it went into more of sort of... I don't know, I found it easier after that. Um, but I, I, I couldn't... Um, 
like in that first chapter, it's like I couldn't see the, the stuff about being of service in there. And um, yeah, so I don't know, for myself, I've, I've, it's just making me more aware of how much I don't actually want to love people. And um, yeah. yeah. So. Thanks, Savannah. Yeah. That's really a okay. um, brave thing to share. And I feel that... Um, you know, when we find... And when I first picked up these books, I was pretty hardened to them myself as well. I, I never thought I'd be sitting here waxing lyrical about them to a bunch of people because I, I couldn't get what it was about. And I now I read it and I cry, but when I first picked it up, that wasn't the case. I was a bit bored some of the time, you know, or I'd feel like, oh, this is very wordy. What's he trying to say, you know? And um, I feel that was also because my heart was very angry and closed to loving... And um, what I'm seeing is that the more I pray about just feeling my own pain, my heart opens more. So, as you know from the teachings, it's it's the the anger and the hard shell we put outside the anger that's there um, we've put there as a defence or as a protection of this fear and grief. So, if I'm sure, I feel sure if you pray about those things, as yeah, lots will change. Barbara. On summing up this chapter for me, um, it was a beautiful chapter as we all know and very moving and it was very emotional but when I got to the part where the old man um, was I didn't passing, even get there and yeah, that's the most beautiful I, part of the chapter, it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, honestly, I, I felt so much grief that when he was saying to his friend, John, John, you know, I've seen angels and John obviously said to him, has Jesus come? And he said, no, not for me. Yeah such that the thought that Jesus could never come to him, you know, the, that he was unworthy of Jesus to come to him. And I felt just huge grief for that and um, overwhelmed. But obviously it's um, my own sadness in that I don't believe that um, Jesus could come for me <laughs> as well. Um, so I spent some, a lot of time crying about that. Mm. I think it was a, a beautiful, just it was a... One chapter, and it was just so beautiful. Yeah. One one um, paragraph, paragraph, sorry, but it was very yeah. beautiful. Very beautiful. Yeah, that, and that he was so. He's know? very humble man, humble. isn't he? Oh, yeah. extremely he doesn't, humble. He doesn't place importance on what it is that he's given in his life, nope. and yet he's given more than all of us have given, really. Yeah. He's given out of when he didn't have a lot, he's given what he what yeah. he had yeah. to someone yeah, else. His own and shoes, his own glasses, yes. you know, all of those things. Yeah. His own food from his table yeah. and he's a poor man himself. Yeah. All of those things. Yeah. yeah. And there is a very... And that, and why would God, why would Jesus come to him at his yeah. time when he's passing? He's unworthy of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. huge humility. It is humility and and it's also that he doesn't believe himself to be he's not worthy. self-important. Yes, it's not uh, it's not even necessarily that he doesn't feel worthy. He just doesn't he doesn't feel that he's uh, I'm Anybody. all that of yeah of that that Jesus should come to me and a number of times through these books we meet characters who are just so humble that they feel like Fred himself let the good things go to the people who really need them. Now, that's not saying I, I don't deserve it. They're saying, but, you know, I don't need it as much as somebody else or I, I'm not that important as somebody else. And it's, that is, um, yeah, I suppose it triggers lots of emotions for me as well. Yeah. And the fact that Jesus has come <laughs> for us. Yes. And uh, many people don't feel humble about that fact, yeah. And I'm, I've been in error in that too, and that made me realise that as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I see very often this quality that Fred has of trust is so lacking on the planet that when Jesus comes, nobody can just trust that, that he is, he is what he, that there's no pretense within him, that what he's saying is what he really means. And there's also no trust that um, if it wasn't to be that case, that we would see that. <laughs> uh, and as a result, nobody sees that it is the first case that he is just saying who. But anyway, now I'm really emotional, so uh, he's just stating the truth to us. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any final reflections before we leave? I wanted to read to you um, the end of the verse in Galatians because I just thought, think it's so beautiful and 
as we said, this chapter is so much about service. So remember I read to you, um, it's from Galatians 5. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm not a Bible scholar, but 5 verse 7. Uh, No, 6 verse 7, sorry. Do not be misled. God is not one to be mocked. For whatever a man is sowing, this he will also reap. Because he who is sowing with a view to his flesh will reap corruption from his flesh. But he who is sowing with a view to the Spirit will reap everlasting life from the Spirit. So let us not give up in doing what is fine. For in due season we shall reap if we do not tire out. Really then, as long as we have time favourable for it, for it, let us work what is good towards all. I just think that it, that is such a beautiful um, verse. <laughs> uh, that... Let us work with what we have to serve those people around us. And um, I found that very inspiring to me. For a long time, um, I've been feeling that I'm not ready to serve in the way that seems to be in front of me and that um, other people would do that better. But I see that that was really not my real feelings. I was just afraid. And that verse to me just inspires me to serve with what I do have, with who I, who I am right now. So I thought it might be a nice way to leave the group today. Repeat it, yeah. It says, Do not be misled. God is not one to be mocked. For whatever a man is sowing, this he will also reap. Because he who is sowing with a view to his flesh will reap corruption from his flesh. But he who is sowing with a view to the Spirit will reap everlasting life from the Spirit. So let us not give up in doing what is fine, for in due season we shall reap if we do not tire out. Really then, as long as we have time favourable for it, let us work what is good towards all. And the end of the verse is, but especially towards those related to us in the faith. But I don't agree with that one. (laughs) So I left it off. <laughs> I feel that if we work towards uh, serving everyone, uh, that is how God s- serves. He serves everyone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for your time this week. Um, yeah, and thanks for your engagement and uh, your reflections. Yeah, we'll, we'll see you. Trev, yeah. don't need to clap. <laughs> We just have a mic to Trev there. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, I just want to thank AJ again for his bluntness. Um, it always gives me the most um, um, will to do what I need to do, I guess, or guidance when you're saying about um, I've had a lot of grief coming up, but um, yeah, not relating it to what I've actually done to other people, feeling a lot of sadness. So thanks for being blunt again and, and um, bringing that to all our awareness that, that actually we feel like crap because of what we've done uh, to others, not what others have done to us. So, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. I feel that my man was uh, sending me some messages about needing to be a bit more blunt today. <laughs> if I read the signals correctly, is that right, babe? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for your grace, guys. I can feel my uh, areas where I need to improve in this little, uh, <laughs> this little group setting. Nina? I don't think this needs to be recorded, but I just think it's really amazing. What if you, just so everyone can hear you here. So. I, I think it's really amazing what Igor and Lena, and I don't know who exactly does it behind the scenes. but just That would be AJ the, does it behind the scenes. <laughs> all the stuff that ends up on Wizard Shack and that last week's book group was already up there and the beautiful um, slideshow of the summer concert. and I just think it's pretty amazing that all that happens for us and we just log online and it's all laid out it's there. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing, yeah. yeah. Can I, can I just tell you some of what happens behind the scenes? Please. Yeah. So last week, it was actually Lena 
who did all of the editing for the book group to go online so quickly and that was it took her quite a while because she had to learn how to do that process she or she'd done it but not in that degree before so yep so thank you so much Lena and Igor is usually the one who's editing everything and the production team I believe created the slideshow that you saw of is that right yep Dave, Dave Robinson took the photos and yep, I put yep. Them together. and Igor put them together but the vast majority of everything else AJ does <laughs> he is the one who knows how to use every camera the guys all help to set up and everything, but AJ is basically the, the guy who knows what goes where, how it all goes together. He ensures that everything is right before we start anything. Afterwards, Lena and Igor take home some of the data, but AJ also, because he um, doesn't want anything that is done to be lost, he backs up every single recording. So that takes a lot of his time and effort, and that's something that um, I... And working, I want to be more involved in that so it doesn't fall to him so often. But he even does little things like charges up the camera batteries. He's the one who recharges the little batteries that go in the, the receivers. He has purchased all of his equipment. He knows how to put every microphone on, what everything does. And he's just worked for a couple of days getting the karaoke system all sorted. So he's, he's more than just... Uh, giving you the message he's packaging it and delivering it and doing everything behind the scenes so pretty awesome yeah thanks babe